So in our previous video, we saw how the um, ways that we could regulate gene expression was based on um, altering the chromatin, either euchromatin or heterochromatin, and then also at specific transcription factors to regulate transcription. So now what we're going to look at is if transcription does occur, how can we regulate the ultimate protein product? And so with this, there's multiple steps involved. So in reality, when we're talking about um, like gene expression and regulating it, we're ultimately looking at the amount of um, protein that's made. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, the amount of protein that is made um, within the cell, so the amount of functional protein here. And so with that, um, what we can see is we are looking at post-transcriptional regulation because we're ultimately looking at the activity of the protein within the cell. So one of those ways is we can look at alternative RNA splicing. And with alternative RNA splicing, um, this is where a, uh, the cell can, like different enzymes, can determine what is considered to be exons and what is considered to be introns. So here, these areas represent the introns. And so what happens in alternative RNA splicing is here we can cut out the introns. Um, well, that's not very smooth, but here we can cut out the introns and now we're left with exons. Um, but how we do this can be different each time. So if we start here with our four exons, well, the next time we edit the RNA, we could end up with a, a mature mRNA that looks like this. So this was that extra intron that we didn't have before. Or we could even edit it in this way. So basically, so here would be the mature mRNA, and now this intron is now considered to be an exon. So in alternative RNA splicing, you have your DNA that codes for a gene, or that is a gene, and then you have your mRNA. This is your pre-mRNA that you edit. So you have introns and exons, and how you shuffle those around, which ones you splice out, which ones you keep, you can get different proteins all from the same strand of DNA. So that is how we could have maybe 25 to 30,000 genes in our DNA, but we have over 100,000 different proteins in our cells and in our bodies, all because of well, one of the reasons is because of alternative RNA splicing. Um, we can also regulate how long we leave the RNA in the um, cytoplasm, and that would determine how much of that protein product is made. So we uh, can vary the length of our adenine tails um, because we have hydrolytic enzymes that are going to like break these down as time goes on. And so um, the longer the RNA lasts in the cytoplasm, the more protein will be made. Uh, now, there's also parts of our DNA that is non-coding. So we have these um, pieces of RNA that are non-coding, and when we think of non-coding, that means it doesn't code for a protein. So here, you can see your typical messenger RNA from a gene that leads to a protein, but we also have areas that are non-coding. They don't code for a protein. So here, they actually code, scientists are discovering, for little pieces of RNA called microRNAs. And the microRNAs can base pair with the messenger RNA. So now when a ribosome comes to attach to read and translate this, moving in this direction, translation would be prevented. So here we can kind of regulate whether or not translation happens you, one of the ways is using microRNAs. So I kind of like this um, picture from the textbook that shows here how a piece of RNA was cut up by an enzyme, so you have little pieces of RNA. Now these RNAs, microRNAs, here's my mature mRNA. This microRNA can actually come and attach through base pairs. A goes with U, C goes with G, and it can actually block the ribosome from translating. So this is one way of translation regulation, um, whether or not the ribosome can read the RNA. Now another example of translation regulation 
would be um, with like a, um, an example is like with iron in the cells. So here, um, if we talk about a gene being turned on, what we see is um, transcription, and then the protein, it codes for a protein called ferritin. So ferritin is an intracellular protein that stores excess iron in cells. If it has too much iron, iron can be toxic, so it's important to be able to store it and keep the levels balanced. So if you had high iron, then you would do translation and make this protein to store the iron so it's not toxic in your cells. So let's go ahead and see how we can regulate translation. So what we have here is we have a, an iron response element. So it's part of the mRNA that can help to respond to the presence or absence of iron. So with that, um, if there is enough, like there's adequate or more than enough iron, um, will we need to make ferritin? And the answer is yeah. If there's enough iron, we should make ferritin. So that way um, we can store that excess iron and it doesn't become toxic in the cells. However, or actually I should point out too, this protein coding region of the mRNA is coding for the protein ferritin. Um, now, what we can see though, if there isn't enough iron, do you really want to store it? And the answer is no. So do we want to build ferritin? No. So with this, there's other proteins that will actually, um, here is an iron response protein, and it's going to attach to this iron response element, and that will block translation. And so now there's no ferritin produced. Another way to look at it, in actuality, that mRNA is kind of cool how it folds up like a bobby pin or a hairpin. And now this yellow part is the um, iron response protein, an IRP, that will help to regulate translation. And so what happens here is the iron response element from before. So really we're looking at like this part here. Um, here's the IRE, iron response element. The yellow part in the next slide is that purple here. So now, if there's low iron, well, then we don't want to make um, ferritin, so ferritin translation will be blocked, and no ferritin will be made. So if we, like, block this area, then the ribosome cannot attach, and there's no ferritin when iron levels are low. However, if there is excess iron, well, the iron can attach um, to this protein, changing its shape, removing it from the iron response element, and now translation can be made. So uh, again, so here's your coding region. If there's high iron, you will make ferritin in order to uh, store the excess iron. However, when there's low iron, that protein would be harmful to us. So we are going to have the IRPs attach, and then there's no translation. So when we look at a summary of gene regulation, you have um, your chromatin, the DNA packing, is it heterochromatin or euchromatin, as well as transcription factors. That's going to be at the level of transcription. We can regulate the final protein product. We also have, if transcription happens, you have post-transcriptional regulation, so we can do alternative RNA splicing. Um, we can alter our length of our poly-A tail. Um, and then we have, in the cytoplasm, we have translation. We can basically try to block the start of translation using either uh, microRNAs or in the case of ferritin, like a protein that will attach, blocking the ribosome. And then lastly, post-translation, how long that protein exists in the cytoplasm can also have an impact on the overall um, protein product, I guess. All right, good job.